Okay, Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Mind Heist, episode 80. The, the big, big eight zero. Eight zero. I'm oh. here with the man himself. Mr. Akhi Tweet, beard shorter than normal, Muhammad. Oh, you're making it very difficult for me to appear on camera looking like this, man. <laughs> I'm sure no one would. Yeah, that's the thing. No one would notice unless I mention it. <laughs> well, that's it now. COVID's over, isn't it? Oh. Yeah, because they decided it was. Bro, everything was, everything was, um, I say everything, but pubs and clubs started opening last night. Yeah, um, back to normal. Yeah, so I had to work a 12-hour shift just dealing with it. It was, it was just, it was a weird atmosphere. It was like a bit chaotic. Mm. It, the weather was the weather was quite bad, mm. but people just it's like they're um, they just have to do it. They have to go out and get drunk, mm. you know. And because there's a there's like all these restrictions in about how many people can go in, mm. about like people just start drinking on the streets and uh, fights breaking out. And mm. I kind of miss the lockdown, man. I miss <laughs> that kind of mm. you know quiet nights, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what's your, you know, now that, you know, I guess it's kind of the lockdown least is over. Obviously mm. certain restrictions are in place still and everything. I guess you, you wear, you have to wear a mask like throughout your shift pretty much. Is that? No. Um, now it's only in hospitals, hospitals still. Oh. Sort of, yeah. Like the NHS seems, mm. seems to be like mm. running by its own rules as opposed to yeah. government guidelines. Yeah. So now, in fact, hospitals now, it seems like it's more than it was before. Like mm. now you can't even wait in, like you used to be able to wait inside. Now you have to wait outside. Every single person in the hospital has to wear a mask before it was like just the patients or, mm. you know, whether you wanted to or not. Now it's like mandatory. You can't go in unless you do. Mm. Um, stuff so, like that really. So it's been like, two months, three months since this whole thing started, right? And we had a few episodes talking about, uh, you know, some of these theories that are going around about it. But now that it's been a while, are you thinking about it any differently than back then, like two months ago? Three months? Um, yeah, I think I am because I, I can't say, I can't say what I think. However, I am a lot less inclined to Oh, look at that, Halib. Halib al <laughs> <laughs> uh, Um I think it's only because a lack of exposure to it um, in terms of see, like coming into the contact with people that have had it, mm -hmm. you know? I'm not denying it exists. I'm not denying people have had it, but I'm also like, like we were at work, we were preparing for like absolute wipeouts of teams, you know? Maybe. We were, yeah, we were like, okay, this is going to wipe out our entire team. To how we like, we had all these contingency plans in place. And Wait, stuff. when you say wipe out, you mean you thought they're going to die? Like not die, team. but like, oh, not be able all to the, like a whole team of people would get ill at once oh. because mm. we all like we all work with each other and we were swapping yeah, yeah. around. And, yeah. and there was like all sorts of measures in place. Like we had to wipe cars down before we used, wipe everything down before we used mm. it. They were even considering like permanently pairing up people so there's less. Mm. Because usually what we do every day, we swap who's working with who. Mm. And yeah, so they were thinking of doing stuff like that. And um, they divided up apartment uh, departments so that, so that like at least if one department got knocked out, like one half of a department got knocked out, the other half would still be running as opposed yeah. to the whole department going at once. All these other things. But like I was speaking to like the, well, quite a high ranking inspector and he was just like, yeah, I thought it was going to wipe out everyone, but it was like all the rules now are out the window because it's not really doing anything to anyone. However, however, that's not me denying that it's out there. I'm not denying that it's out there. I've just tuned out a lot. But I think a lot of people have because they've just, it's only so long that you can keep listening to the news, you know, and getting exposed mm -hmm. to that fear. And at the same time, we can't deny the fact that it benefits news media to keep talking about it because it's, it's fear, isn't it? and propagation of fear and you see that with a lot of things now oh it's always been a thing isn't it just you know the media trying to anyway but as far as that and also i i i kind of got rid of a lot of news um 
I used to have a few news apps on my phone that I would keep updated with social media news sites had to keep updated with kind of just tuned out of a lot of that started focusing on other things mm. um but bro like Allah knows best that's all I can say uh, you know there's there's been medical professionals that we follow on social media that are Muslim for example that I trust they're they're still concerned and if they're concerned then then I'll, I'd, I'm more inclined to sort of lean with them mm-hmm. um you know I don't want I, I'm not like we're going to start hugging around and people and stuff. They spoke, I got a message yesterday from the local masjid saying that they're due to reopen, but I don't know, man. I think the masjids are in a really hard place because they are, they have to represent Islam. So they have to, they, they almost like they've got no choice, but to um, comply with whatever regulations are out there to the maximum, because they don't want to be labeled as the people that are causing it, yeah. you know, cause there's already been articles about, Oh, look, the biggest importation of coronavirus in the UK was from Pakistani tourists or people coming over from Pakistan and stuff like this. And that yeah. people get hold of that. And they're like, Oh, look what you're doing. Um, like the message that actually, let me read the rules. Let me read the rules. Mm. Cause there was like a 10, 10 rules for the opening of the message from your local message. Yeah. It's from my local message. So, Monday, what day is it today? Sunday. Okay, so this should be from tomorrow. Mm. Um, so number one, uh, wudu must be performed at home. Wudu at the to- and toilet facilities will be unavailable at the masjid. Number two, the mosque will be open 10 minutes before the prayer and closed 10 minutes after the prayer. Number three, bring your own prayer mat and your own shoe bag. Now, do you know what? Number three, I think, is probably the best one. I don't think anything else matters. I think number three, bring your own prayer mat that kind of makes sense to me because once you do sojour, you're breathing on the carpet and then someone else can pray and breathe. Yeah. If everybody's got their own prayer mat, I don't think the whole standing next to each other is an issue. I honestly don't like based mm. on, I'm not an expert, but I just don't, it, it doesn't compete with, it doesn't compute with me. However, like, yeah, if I'm like sojoured, breathe on, on the carpet. Yes. I can understand if someone else went on that carpet. Yes. Yeah. So I think that is the best thing. And I think that should have been the only real solution really. Um, Maybe we'll do it at home, like try and have we'll do it at home and come in. Yes, that that makes sense to me. Uh, face masks or covering are highly advised. Sure. I mean, those two together, I think, wear a face mask. and But the whole thing about like uh, social distance prayer, oh, I can't. I, I just doesn't sit right with me. I, I can't. Have you, you know what I mean? It, any shiuch kind of talking about that as a ruling? Like is that I haven't I haven't looked too deeply into it. Yeah. I've just the only thing I ever saw that was quite critical of the whole positioning of, you know, the Ummah at the moment was Mufti's sort of like questioning about it all. Because I'm I think Mufti's been running Jumai as since this all started because he's still uploading every Friday YouTube khutbas and you can still hear somebody doing the then. Yeah. So it's like I think he's still running, I don't know where, maybe in a private place and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um I remember there was a lot of fatwa initially saying, "Hey, you can't make you can't pray Juma at home," but I know that Mufti back 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 like bounced that back and sort of like, well, you can't just have no Juma just because of a, the fear of something, as opposed to the fear yeah. of possibly getting something, as opposed to the fear of actually happening. You mm-hmm. know, yeah. um, so it's a bit of a difficult one, like. I, and I think obviously with all my, uh, with all my recent, I say all of my recent, I've just obviously been quite interested in history and stuff. And I've, I've been getting those tidbits of like Islamic history. And like, you just hear about, you read about like all these incredible events of the past, but people didn't stop praying or people didn't stop. And now we've got like this and it's like, oh yeah, let's just stop kind mm. of thing. Yeah. Bro, like, like there's no hajj this year, bro, for, for people. That's crazy, man. Like that's insane. And like, yeah. I don't know how Muslim. I don't know if Muslims are hurting in their hearts because of it, or if they're just mm. if it's just exposing the hypocrisy within us. Of yeah, we don't mind mm. either way. Yeah, Allah you know, Allah, you know, yeah. You um, know over um, here the. I'll go on, bro. Finish the list. No, sorry. Yeah, I'll go through the list. Um, so number four was face masks. Highly advised. Number five, the masjid operates a one-way system. Entrances and exits are clearly marked. Now we've only got two doors, and they're side by side. So I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, number six, please sanitize your hands on entry. Number seven, you'll be asked to provide your name and number for track and trace purposes. Oh. Like, I don't mind giving, I don't mind giving, I don't really care about stuff like that. But I just think it's like, 
we can't, we're not in a position now where we're going to track and trace anything. Like, there's no way that you can, if, do you know how many people work at my workplace? You're going to say that I'm going to, six degrees of separation, bro. Like, we're going <laughs> to, the whole yeah. world will be, will be touched by just one person. Um, yeah. Number eight, please maintain social distancing while attending for prayers. We have clearly marked and designated spaces for prayer and pre- requested the brothers ensure that they are following social distancing guidelines. Now, I don't know if that means they've actually spaced it out. I won't know until I go. I'm going to try and go tomorrow, inshallah, just to mm. see what the vibe is. Oh, just um, to see, yeah? That's why you're going to the masjid. Well, actually, I'll be honest. <laughs> I'll be honest. The masjid is quite far from me. Yeah, yeah. So, but the thing is, if I... I just don't know how comfortable I'll feel because... It just doesn't feel right, you know. I, what, what I'm one of those. I'm, the the distancing. Like I'm yeah, one yeah. of those people. Like I want to be feet to feet, shoulder to shoulder. Oh, you are stepping not, on my, my little yeah. toe is getting crushed by yours. <laughs> and I get a bit like you know. I'm one of those people. I know there's a difference, and I know there's people who have different understandings, or whatever. But like, I'm one of those people. Like if they move their feet away from me, then I'm like, well, it's not like there's evidence to say leave a gap, is there? Yeah, there's either yeah. evidence to say put it together you, yeah. and there's then nothing. That's what people believe. However, if I put my foot next mm. to yours and then you actively move it away, then I'm like, well, what's your evidence for moving it away? Mm. <laughs> Do you understand Basically, what I mean? Like, <laughs> your foot becomes Tom and his foot is Jerry. <laughs> well, this is Wherever it, he goes, you're chasing. Oh, subhanAllah. Anyway, so like, I, I just, I don't know. It just doesn't feel right. Um, nine, please refrain from socializing and standing in groups inside at the mosque and when leaving after prayer, that will never happen bro like we try to do that for Ramadan and people just don't listen yeah and then number 10 please ensure that you arrive on time and that's about it but yeah mm. are you are the message message open over there yeah man I was gonna say uh, so last week I think about I think it was last uh, you know Sunday Monday Tuesday one of them days last week they they opened them but they said no Jumwa only the five Salawat, and uh, this is the this is the this is the reason I haven't been here. In order to go in, they said you have to have the contact tracing app on your phone. So okay. I don't know if I don't know how it works. Like, is there somebody at every single message where they're going to like scan it, scan it, or like uh, I don't know about that. But I'm not getting that app. So yeah, and they and then you have to you pray like three meters apart. And you have to wear a mask while praying and stuff. I don't, so, mind, I don't mind wearing a mask, mm. man. But like the whole three meters apart thing, I just don't feel like my prayer yeah. is valid. You know, mm. I just, mm. I know that, I know that like, I know that it's about protecting lives and that. But it, to me, it's just, I don't know. It just doesn't no, You know what right. it is though, Muhammad? I think uh, people, people's, basically, you know what it is? I think there's an element of, People are just following. There's a lot of following going on. There's not yeah. a lot of questioning things going on at all at, at many levels. So yeah. like the Masajid are not questioning government guidelines, right? Governments are not questioning WHO information and etc. Like there's a lot of just, I'm just going to follow. And some of that is just because, you know, people follow authority. They just kind of trust it. The other element I think is when you're, when there are many unknowns, you just tend to avoid risk as much as possible, right? So it's like, if you think about it, shutting down the whole economy or most of the economy, it's really drastic, right? But Mm -hmm. at that point, at least, you know, a few months ago, uh, there were many unknowns. And so it's like, look, let's just do like the safest thing, which is doing that. So there's a lot of following, man. Um, I know know the message, like their hands are tied. It's not them that really mm -hmm. want to do this. They just have to follow. It's better they do that and open than stay closed um, yeah yeah maybe however like the heart and soul of the message is kind of gone in the sense like you can't sit and you can't read and you can't listen to a yeah and you can't it's just especially like the, so, the social element of it all yeah and I, I think what frustrates me is like bro you should have seen the, the heat of the summer the other day like down here i went up to london just to avoid it all right? it was absolutely insane they said, oh, I can't remember what they said. Like it was <laughs> you were going one direction. Everyone was coming the other, yeah? Bro, I can't remember what Brighton, <clears throat> lemon tons. Basically, like the waste that was collected from the beach. Yeah, 11, oh. tons of, 11 tons of rubbish left on Brighton Beach in one day. The most ever recorded. 
Wow. So not only did they come and like, you know, rub shoulders with each other and stuff, mm. um, they flip in, uh, left 11 tons of rubbish on the beach, bro. It's absolutely nuts, man. I just don't like the general public. I think they're just selfish. <laughs> you just don't like humans. <laughs> oh, bro, I can't deal with it, Achie. Yeah, yeah. I can't deal with it. My it's summary, like those bro. People, hmm. It's like the, the, the definition of the general public is like, you have a tape, right? And it says, do not cross. And you're standing there guarding it. And they're like, excuse me, mate, can I, can I just go over there? I'm like, for goodness sakes, bro. Yeah. It says, like, how clear do I have to be? It's, oh, anyway. That's mm. just like the definition of public for me. Mm. Now, times that by God knows whatever situation you've got. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying, like you, yeah? I'm not saying there's no virus. I'm not saying it doesn't kill people. Mm. But what I am quite clear of for myself, you know, I'm not telling anyone else what to believe, but I think there's definitely a lot of unanswered questions and a lot of, you could say, uh, suspicious things and yeah. also it's just you know at the at the very least at the most being the most positive and the most unskeptical i would say there's been a huge overreaction mm. and that overreaction has actually cost lives as well hasn't it it's cost obviously livelihoods which sometimes does cost lives but it's really uh it's really um overblown basically it's interesting um if oh for some reason I activated Siri by saying that okay be quiet don't no, no, stop okay um, Siri's trying to report your opinion on this to the authorities <laughs> probably I'll tell you what's really interested me so this past few this past month or stuff I've been getting really like involved in the stock market right okay so, yeah all bro. in on Tesla bro pretty much <laughs> pretty much um, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and what's fascinated me is I have now, because I am invested in certain companies and I am now like, basically like I find myself just looking at the stock market every day, which is something I never, ever did before. Didn't really interest me. But now that I'm now a participant in that, you know, in the economy, so to speak, um, suddenly I'm thinking about the world and the world events in a different way. Mm. which kind of makes me feel guilty because now I, 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 it's almost like I took a slice of like, I don't know, the mind of politicians and all these rich people and stuff and, um, and realized, for example, people were complaining, the public were rightfully complaining that like say in America, um, all these American like billion dollar companies got like propped up when the economy went like yeah. shut down mm. whilst all these poor people that were out of jobs didn't get much help right mm, mm. and and i know it sounds really bad but this is this was the slice that made me think i was like oh yeah great these companies i'm invested in got propped up so they're not going to go bust so my money yeah. is safe kind of thing yeah however that made me think subhanallah like that's that must be how all these rich people thinking that's why all these rich people like politicians help business like big businesses out and big businesses help politicians out and that's why this thing exists because people are invested, like the rich mm. are invested within each other. Yeah. Right? And then everyone who hasn't got the capital to get invest or be part of that system falls by the wayside. And, and then I felt, I felt guilty in a way because I was like, Oh, now I'm like a participant of this sort of, this sort of a uh, cycle mm. or this yeah. circle of like inner circle of, benefiting because I was thinking, the, yeah. yeah, benefiting it from me. Cause I was like, Oh, um, you know, if this company that I'm invested in uh, just goes bust, then I don't want it to go bust because I'm invested in it. Oh yeah, the government propped it up. Sweet, that's awesome. Mm. Good on the government. Do you, know, <laughs> do you understand yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But then, but then, like you forget about you know other bits and pieces. So um, yeah, it was just an interesting sort of. Mm. I mean, you, you, I guess what you would aim to do is like be very balanced, where it's like, yes, I do want to win. I do want to win. You know, I want my personal gain. You know, there, but. Yeah. If, it, if that comes at the cost of something quite important for someone else, then, okay, not really, not really actually happy about that. I, I think um, what Muslims should, it's hard, right? It's about striking that balance. And we've spoken about it many times before where it's like, do you want to shun the dunya away 
entirely or do you want to participate in it but then let it take over and the middle path is like i might not what i want trying to do what i'm aiming to do what aspirations are is like i'm not trying to you know the assets and liabilities sort of discussion you know i'm not trying to just spend money and buy things you know i'm not trying to make money just to spend it mm -hmm. but i would like to benefit others and benefit the ummah with whatever I can attain. Like I, I'm still deeply affected by this Ramadan, bro. I think this Ramadan was exposed me deeply to the concept of like charity and longevity with charity, you know, not just like, okay, I fed you a meal. It's more like, you know, look at this infrastructure we've built for these people. And now that they can rely on them, you know, rely on their, this infrastructure that we've laid the, the groundwork for. And how many how many people could really live such better lives if we laid the groundwork and the framework for them to mm. to do that sort of stuff and it's not just about like okay i would love to be able to just set businesses up for people as opposed to just oh here we are here's a bag of rice kind of thing do you know what yeah. i mean like enrich people's economy like local locally like local economy like little villages bro like have someone set up like uh, you know help somebody set up some sort of trade thing or like some food trade or some something bro something to just instill some of that goodness in people because i uh, inshallah the people that you help will then remember that and then help others it's like passing it on isn't it um and also they'll make dua for you and they'll mm. uh you know be a witness for you yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, we, we like a good economy is, is an interesting thing. And if we can learn to, to buy and sell from each other and we learn to, I know it's, it's been spoken about a lot, but like inter community sort of spending, like intercultural spending where you've got like communities that only buy and sell from each other. And like with, we've got this uh, inferiority complex anyway, where we just partly because of ourselves, like we are to blame. Like we just don't like, supporting the muslim businesses we don't like supporting startups we don't like supporting or sharing people's efforts and stuff like that and then also those who do own those muslims who do own that kind of stuff are very i'm not saying all obviously not but i'm saying you do find some that are like cut corners very easily or feel like they can rip off their muslim brothers or you know they use the inshallah card but they don't really mean it mm. um all these sort of things actually we should be the top of the food chain when it comes to morality and and um do you, you know, you think business that, and stuff. do you think that Muslims should like support each other's businesses just because they're Muslims? No, no. I, but I think they should if it's, I should, I don't, I don't, I don't like being forced to buy or purchase something I don't want. I didn't want. Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm not really here for that. Like I don't want to share in that kind of stuff or if there's something I'm passionate about, but like, yeah, mm. but like, I don't like the whole, pressure me into buying from you when i don't actually need any of it yeah. what you are selling however however if there is you know if somebody is if a muslim brother or a muslim company is selling something that actually i could also buy from a non-muslim and you know the quality is more or less the same or even if the quality is a little bit less actually, it's about the long yeah. it's about the yeah it's about what they're trying to achieve you yeah. know and you can because, see it because mm, ultimately it ultimately you helping them is good for you as well and your family because mm. inshallah that will empower the muslims in general and uh you know i guess do for your brother what uh, you would you would like your brother to do for you definitely bro. I've, I've got something for you then yeah go on since, since you said what you said yeah now i've cornered you <laughs> go on, now, corner me uh, have you heard of rizq yeah i'm showing it on the screen oh bro i signed up to that and i got an email i never downloaded it um mm. Is it just, um, go on, explain it to me. Yeah, so it's, it's basically a digital-only bank. Um, mm -hmm. Like Monzo. Yes, exactly. It's like Monzo, actually, more than others, because it's, it's UK-focused, I think, for now. It's definitely Europe-focused only. So I don't think, for example, they have like a dollar account or anything like that. Um, and it's, it's like no interest and easy to give charity through it and Sweet. stuff like that. So... I'm I'm waiting to see what comes uh, other than those things, but of course, like if if I the th the problem is uh, I I need a dollar account. Like 
you know, I have a Monzo account, but I've never used it and I might right. just close it. Um, so I, I definitely don't need this, but if, if I w did, then I think it looks good, bro. With the, I know actually, I know of the brother who, who launched it. His name's Ekman Salim. He's got a ton of experience in business and uh, investment and stuff like that. Right. And uh, actually my, my business partner, Mohammed, he interviewed him for um, our uh, Muslim CEO, our podcast. So uh, actually he didn't release that yet, but it'll come out in the next few weeks. And so um, it looks good, is bro. It, yeah. is he's, it, he's raised um, some capital. He's got good uh, people on board. Is it so, under like uh, MasterCard or Visa? Visa, like, yeah, working yeah, with? Visa, yeah. Ooh, I might get involved then. Because Monzo is under MasterCard. Yeah. Um, thing is, I just don't know if I would use, like I don't know how I would use it now because I don't have a need uh, for another bank account. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if I had a need for another bank account, it'd have to be a traditional bank because sometimes um the limit what what kind of limits does it have on it do you know in terms I know of, a lot of withdrawing or spending or everything so mm, like a lot no, of these digi know. digital banks have like limits oh, really? so for example yeah like let me get the monzo one the monzo one i think changes based on you how often you you've used it mm. so initially it's like not a lot but then oh got uh, it yeah yeah but now like the limit is um oh i don't bloody remember like, yeah, like cash deposit limits on Monzo. You can deposit between five pound and three hundred pound in one go, and up to one thousand in total every six months. Whoa! If you're sixteen to seventeen years old, that's it, that limit's lower. So you can only deposit a maximum of five hundred pounds every six months. Like this is cash deposits, right? Yeah, and it's like it's it's not. It's fine if you're like a, an individual who's basically all you do is get paid from your job and you know, you're not really doing anything else. You're not really trying to hustle or whatever you want to call it. But um, once you've got, you know, once you're trying to do bigger things and trying mm. to, it's kind of like, Oh, this is a bit annoying. Like the yeah. other day I was trying to do something and I hit my limit and I had to like, I don't know. I had to wait and mm. you know, okay. um, the reason they do that is so basically because it's so easy to set up yeah. and you don't need an address. Um, it's, it's to curb like basically mm. fraud, fraud mm. and, and oh, you don't mainly. need an address. No, you don't need an address. You need to be a UK resident in a sense that you need a, uh, like a national insurance number. I think if I remember correctly, mm. however, you don't need an mm. address with it. Cause when I signed um, up for like Monzo, yeah. um, what was it? I needed to send them a scan of ID. Yeah. I think I needed to put an address. Obviously, I, maybe I could have put any address because they didn't verify. I think, yeah, exactly. I think you, you need an address so you can get like a card sent to oh, you. Oh, of course. Yeah, true. Yeah. But, but other than that, I, mm. I remember the whole thing about it. Anyway, because I've predominantly used it now as my main bank account. Yeah. My only bank account because I shut my other one down. Mm. Um, I'm sort of like in this position now because I realized the other day, I was like, oh, subhanAllah, if I lose my smartphone, I'm kind of screwed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, I can log in on my wife's phone, for example, but like, I don't really want to do that. And then I, that means I always need to have a smartphone. Yes. You know, um, and I, I don't think there's a client for it on the desktop. No, not. And, and that's yeah. that's something that I think it sucks. Like, mm. I really want a, I really want a desktop client yeah. because I would like to say if I had to like, you know, get rid of my smartphone. You know, want to have a break from my smartphone or whatever. Yeah. I'd like to be able to just go on the desktop, check my finances. Okay, boom, yes. go back. You know, yeah, use yeah. a card, or whatever. I'm so somebody, I bro. Like who I actually often dislike doing things on on a phone. Like for me, for example, writing a long Instagram caption. I can't get my head around how people do that on their phones. Like really? that is something I need to do it on a computer. Um, many things I, I prefer. Like a, a lot of the time, I'm using WhatsApp on my you know, my laptop, um, because just typing, I feel restricted on my phone, you know? Really? Yeah. Oh, bro. I'm complete opposite. I use so many different apps, like interchangeably oh, you with edit, each like, other. Videos on your phone. I can't bro. get my head around that. Okay. But yeah. Like, so that clip that we put up on mind heist the other day, yeah. the entire thing was done on my phone yeah, from yeah. like, rec from like screen recording it from YouTube to, uh, cutting it, you know, cutting, Obviously, it was a longer clip. It was like a minute long, and I cut it to thirty seconds. I cut it all on my phone. Um, 
I, you know, added the sort of film grain effects on my phone. I put the subtitles manually on my phone, like for each bit. Wow. Um, you know, exported it on my phone, popped it on there on my phone. Everything, mm. bro. Um, yes, maybe it'll be faster and more easier to do on the thing. It took me maybe about 40 minutes, 30 minutes to do. Mm. That's why it takes a while. Yeah. Um, however, however, if you've got the time, I'm out. It's less sort of hassle in the sense that I don't have to wait till I get home or like I'm out. You know, and a lot. And the reason why I do a lot on my phone is because sometimes while I'm at work, I might have some downtime, yeah. and I haven't got any other distractions. Like I haven't got like oh the kid jumping on me, or I have to do something for my wife, or I have to. Do you know what I mean like mm. I don't want to be like just glued to my phone while I'm here. But when yeah. I'm out, it's just me and I'm isolated, so maximize what I can do on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But people haven't unlocked the potential, bro. Like, you, uh, especially like, okay, I, I used to do like a lot of graphic design stuff on my phone. And um, a lot of people would ask like, oh, how did you make this? Blah, blah, blah. And I, I used to send them like a pack of apps that I use in conjunction with each other. Mm. Like, okay, this is what I use for like cutting backgrounds and putting stuff together. This is what I use to sort of add these particular effects or whatever. And then you just, you layer it on top of each other and boom, you've got mm. something to put out there. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, bro. So this is crap. What I would like to see from it is because they never mentioned right that the money that is in your account is not being invested in haram thing. Maybe we could assume that, but out of all the selling points that they have on their website, they didn't really mention that. They just said it's interest free, right? That means yeah. I'm not getting interest, but is my money being invested, you know, in places I don't want? So. That's something that is could be unique to a Muslim's banking app. Um, mm. So that's a point. Um, that's like one of the main ones. Like what else do Muslims want? I think this would be difficult, I know. But I, if I was making a, a banking app for Muslims, I would be thinking of how I can give loans yeah. interest-free. Yeah. Um, that would be quite revolutionary. I would like it to also fully integrate with like... Something like launch good or something like that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. I'd I'd want not even not even like oh here's a referral or a link that takes you there. I want like full integration. Yeah. Yes. I think that is like that's almost like to me like the revolution of smartphones or mm -hmm. the revolution of even like Tesla for example like taking jumping from the um, from just auto manufacturers to actual like this is almost like a smartphone vehicle kind of mm -hmm. thing. Like, yeah. because with the software updates and mm. like every sort of iteration has got yeah. its new. Um, so also I think for, for Muslims. Occur, yeah. Uh, I think, I think for Muslims, I think we need to stop thinking of money as like this whole separate entity. I think it should be, you should see it as part and parcel of everything we do. Like it should be, you shouldn't look at money as just money. You should look at money as like a form of a burden. If you, if you're thinking about it in a particular yeah. way, yeah. Uh, such as, okay, we spoke about mini deed before. I don't know yeah. if we spoke about it in depth. Yeah. I can't remember, but like mini deeds are quite new and it's quite like early days. However, the whole concept was brilliant because it was like, you're not just, you're thinking of, you're bringing social media and money and actually fully integrating it as opposed to like click this donation link to go no 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 let's let's make it part and parcel of the whole thing so you like yeah i know bro we chat oh really Everything. what's that no i mean uh you know we chat is basically the, the super app uh in china where everything is, is in that one app um, right yeah, what yeah, that yeah. means of course is that you know they know absolutely everything about you but from from one app you can order a taxi you can uh, pay for stuff in a restaurant, in a supermarket, whatever. There's like maps, there's uh, mm. WhatsApp, all of that in one app. Like that's why it's called a super app. Mm. And um, I think like Facebook wanted to do something like that, but obviously with antitrust and stuff, I don't think people really trust them to do that. So I, yeah. But they are see, actually so getting close to that because they're being quite open now about the fact that Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, it's all one thing. And then they, they, they're definitely moving towards, like they're going to launch Facebook payments soon. They already mm. launched uh, sending money with WhatsApp in Brazil. So they've launched that fully. Yeah. Um, so they're trying to create a super app. Um, but we'll see if they're allowed. I mean, the, yeah, I could see like even Facebook doing that. I mean, one, one thing about fully full integration would be cool. Was like, it would be like 
even like crowdfunding funding amongst your family like if you i mean it's hard to get everybody on the same platform i can understand that however like if you had like all your family members were on this particular platform um then you could literally just crowdfund together for anything so it mm. could be just like could be anything actually. it could be like oh uh you know so and so's uni fund do you know what i mean or so and so needs books or whatever it is and they just literally pop mm. pop a little box and Oh, all well, the family members see that and they want to compete into who's going to give the most and boom, 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 and that's done. Yeah. Get friends involved, that kind of thing. As opposed to everything having to be like this big campaign that needs pushing and it needs begging and it needs whatever. Um, but anyway, I don't know. Maybe I've just, I'm just dreaming of something that I, don't, I can't really actually mm. put into words. Yeah, I um, think the, the reality... But yeah, I think there's a good future, bro. I think... Yeah. I think Muslims are, are you know, they're, they're, they are there are a lot of Muslims now, like such as this risk app, such as other uh, Muslim creatives and pioneers in this sort of field. I think they're actually doing a lot of good work. I think we're getting to that stage now where we're actually, we're Thinking not just copycatting. Our, exactly, yeah, not copycatting. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like, what, you know, what technology do Muslims need for, for our needs, like our unique needs? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and not just our unique needs, but what would be the best for the world, right? Because uh, loans without interest would be better for the whole world. So how do we enable that? Um, I've mm. heard of at least one very creative solution where like business loans, at least, where it's like um, instead of loaning money in exchange for like that added interest, you loan money and that's like you're buying part of it, but you're also agreeing to sell that to them at a later date and so you can make profit off it if as long as the company grows stuff like that uh, obviously i've just uh, kind of summarized that idea but the point is yeah innovation if we think about our unique um you know uh, challenges and needs then inshallah there'll be a lot of innovation yeah bro mm. yeah we just need to stop like this individualistic attitude when it comes to success like it's it's annoying because you've even got like these you know, you've got these individuals that like uh, that use islam as a way to gain themselves and they try and just use you for that purpose for example you have all these multi-level marketing schemes and these pyramid schemes and god knows what else and it's like oh actually do you want to you know what i mean do you want to know how to flip in make residual income well yeah i already know that's why you're talking to me because you want it not me but, do you yeah. what I mean? like, <laughs> but no like let's be sincere let's be real let's you know don't give me that nonsense. Like I can, anyway, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, yeah, bro, I would want my brothers. As, like as soon as I started, like, um, so like this, this, for example, when it came to investing in the stock market and, and learning the halal and haram of it and learning it as a process, cause it was always something that like came across as very intimidating to me. Um, but for years I was like, you know what? Nothing is intimidating unless you actively learn it, you know? And the resources out there to learn anything these days is is great. Mm. So I went on like Udemy, for example. I was like, listen, get me that absolute novice beginner course. Like, just teach me terms. Teach me like what this means, what that means, what it's all about. Mm. So I'm like halfway through that, but I didn't really need to do the rest. Mm. Thought, did that. Big I was boy like, oh. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, I understand. Sweet. I get it kind of thing. Um, and then, then I just exposed myself to that kind of almost like – I don't know what you want to call it, like that world online. So like following pages, following blogs, following just, even if there was reading articles where I didn't 100% understand what they're talking about, the more I exposed myself to that kind of stuff, the more I was like, oh, I understand now what that means. Or I know what like this means for that company, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And then immediately, bro, like I, I've got, I'm in like a group chat with a few brothers, maybe 10, 20 brothers, I don't know. And it was like, I started just talking about what I'd learned to them. And then I realized like a lot of them were like, some of them were like, oh, oh, I don't stay, I don't really want to know about that stuff. Like it's a bit of a gray area for me. I was like, no, no, no. I think you're just intimidated by your lack of knowledge. And that's yeah. why. And then that was what was kind of found out. And then there were some other brothers that had done stuff like that before, but actually they were more on the haram side of things because they'd never looked up the halal and haram of it. And I was like, oh, no, no. 
have a look at this article by this sheikh or have a look at this and this and that will explain why that has happened. And then by the end of it, like three, four, five brothers were like, oh, actually, I want to learn more about this. And then suddenly I felt good about providing resources. It wasn't like, hey, join me. Let's make, I want to make money out of you. It was more like, oh, look at this list of resources I used. I put a a little pack together, all these things I'd found and put together and started using. Mm. And I gave it to them. And now I can speak to brothers about stuff like that because at the end of the day, I remember like, I remember speaking to these brothers before that I'm quite close with them. And I said to them, like, Ikhwan, if anything ever happens to me, like I have trust that you guys would like support my family and look after my kids and stuff. Do you know what I mean? And I'd say, yeah, I'd do the same look for you guys. Like that's the kind of, that's the kind of friendship you'd want, especially as all of us are parents and stuff. Like you want to have a close knit of brothers that like, you know, there's still going to be male role models in your kids' lives. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know that there's still going to be people that can tell your kids stories about you and stuff like that if anything was to ever happen to you and i actively think about if anything was to happen to me like every single day bro Mm -hmm. like every time i leave the house every time i'm like at the door i'm thinking this could actively be the last you know the last day i see my kids or this could actually i don't know why i've thought about it more this year than ever maybe because of my own dad um but um it's got i think any any man should do it you know, I think every man should do it. I think it helps in rationalizing like little disagreements you might have at home or making the most of your time with your kids. You know, mm-hmm. it's really easy to just get sucked into the future and forget about the right here and now because the future is not promised whatsoever. Um, so yeah, things like that, bro. Um, got a bit deep very quickly there. <laughs> Is it something you think about a lot or is it just a phenomenon that I seem to have found myself in? You talking about the whole uh, community thing or um, the death like, thing? The death thing, I mean, yeah, like it's a combination of two. You want a, a community sort of around your family so that you see it now. Like if somebody dies and they haven't got funeral money, then the community gets together. But like you want a bit more than just like strangers getting money for you you want like actual people that you can know actual yeah. people that knew you that you could be like tell your kids oh look this is uncle so-and-so and if anything happens to me then he'll be around to look after you and he'll be not not just yeah. like financially but just as role models do you know what i mean um yeah yeah of course i want that man i just i don't i don't have a fixed location so i need to find a fixed location and then it's like those people that I end up spending time with and getting to know and trusting in that location will become that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right now, I feel like family-wise, I think you know that the, you know there are people that I can trust definitely. I can rely on family-wise. Uh, my family, my wife's family, like that's good. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Um, I've got some friends who would definitely support me, but they're not in the country I'm in, so that's always tricky. Um, yeah. but for me, bro, like my dad, uh, you know, he left his country and now uh, me, like uh, us, we don't have anywhere. So either I decide I'm going to keep living this life and then my kids are going to grow up the way I grew up, or I'm going to try and uh, find somewhere kind of stable that it's like, you don't have this, uh, lingering question in your head of, oh, how how many times, uh, how long will I be here for? Mm. So I, I've kind of, I guess I've decided already that's what I need. Um, I need that place where it's like, yes, we, we live bro, here. This is where you we need live. To, you need to go join Sharif on the farm, bro. That's what's Some, going on. Something like that, yeah. I mean, bro, oh, I'm, just, I'm just looking to buy a light, yeah, for the camera. And I'm thinking, yeah. I'm thinking do I want to buy this? Because then if I leave, how am I going to carry it with me? That's how I think, man. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I want a standing desk, but I'm like, oh, but if, I won't be able to bring it with me if I leave. So it's all every, yeah. you know, at least every purchase I going. think about that. Um, even when uh, I was buying a car, like I was renting a car for a long time. Part of the reason, again, is like, do I want to commit to that level? Um, you know? I've been thinking like, I've been thinking more similar on those lines, but like more of like the moment I purchase something, it's a big it's a big hole in my in the future that money could have made for me 
you know what I mean? Like if I'm not investing my money in something that's either going to benefit me you just financially all or your my... money in Tesla, bro. Bro, bro, <laughs> man. Te- Tesla's a future baby. But, <laughs> but it's also like, you know, not, not, not in that sense, but I think because I got exposed to the potential of, you know, bro, I'm like 27 this month, bro. And I think, oh man, how much money must I, I have long have I been working for? I've been working since I was like 16. Mm. You know I mean, that's like 10 years of working. Bro. Mm. Like, bro, that's 10 years of working and I don't really have much to show for it because anything I, anything I bought had its time limit and it just expired. Yeah, yeah man. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Anything yeah. I spent my money on, just that's it. It's not here mm. with me anymore. Yeah. So that's 10 years of just whatever. That's you know, true, food, man. food, that's drink. I, you know, when I first started working, bro, um, and obviously I was living at home and any type of money I was getting, I was like, yeah, my parents didn't have to give me money anymore. Like my parents didn't, since I started working or since I was at college, I think, I don't think my parents gave me anything because like, I didn't need, they didn't need to. I was fine. Alhamdulillah. Mm. But at the same time, like, did I do anything with that money? No, I like I started buying clothes every flipping week or two, mm. uh, just eating out all of the time, um, going out with my friends and stuff. Uh, that's it. And like, I didn't save, I didn't put anything on the side. And then when I started saving, it was just like, oh, I would save until I got, I had to purchase something or I had to, there was some sort of emergency that I had to pay for. And that's fine. And alhamdulillah, at least I can say that I had my head screwed on where I, I would think deeply about what I would spend the money on, but I would still spend it. Do you understand yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. But you're like budgeting would, now, right? Yeah, but now, bro, like, it's like I'm actively thinking, I'm either saving this money I'm spending it on what my family need or it's getting invested and mm-hmm. anything I save, like I invest it um, because there's no use to me sitting there like not doing anything, you know? Mm. Um, and it's no use to me just buying things I don't actively need. Like, do I need, I'll only need like uh, a new pair of jeans if all my jeans have holes in them. Do you understand what I mean? Or yeah, yeah. like, I'll only need like a new jumper if like my mm. jumper ab- like absolutely looks awful. Yeah. I don't really care generally what I look like. I'm not, I'm going down the Steve Jobs route. <laughs> in a sense like. Oh, you got the black hoodie. Where's the yellow hoodie? I thought that would be your version oh, of that the one. Jobs vibe. I think I gave that away, bro, because um, I can't remember if it got too small on me or I just had it too long. But, but still, like I was out the other day with some, bro- <laughs> some brothers and they were saying, oh, Bro, like we've known you for like a couple of years now, and you're always wearing the same trainers. Like, get yourself a new pair of trainers, sort of thing. I was like, bro, look at these. Like, they're not, they're like Air Maxes, and they were like, oh, Achi, your Air Maxes are meant to be like crisp white. Like, that's how they're meant to be worn. You know? mm. I was like, yeah, but like, they've got no holes in them. They're comfortable. Mm. Don't really care. Did you, you lecture I mean? them like, on consumerism? Well, I could, but be, only because. Like the one of the brothers that was there, because there's only two brothers, one of them was there is like still bachelor, bro. So he's still like in that sort of like, mm. oh, I need to look good all the time mindset. And I don't, I'm not saying that's wrong because we've all been there. Like I remember doing that all the time. But now it's like, oh, time is, time is precious sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not thinking about money in terms of I want to have all these material things. I'm thinking more of like, I want to be able to set things up for my people, bro for my community, for my family. Um, yeah. And just, you know, you, you hear about the people that may, made it in that sort of financial sphere. And then you see things like, like earlier, bro, I was flicking through Twitter and I saw like, oh, this particular footballer arrived at some sort of restaurant or something. And he had like this shiny Ferrari and he just looked so odd. Like I couldn't think of me trying to walk in the street towards my f- flipping shiny ferrari and not feel a certain type of way about myself like not i'm talking not talking about ego i'm talking about embarrassment like, yeah to me it's just, it's just embarrassing like all of those eyes and all that attention on you yeah it's like you know that nobody there is looking at you with like i don't know admiration they're looking at you with either jealousy or they're looking at you like you're showing off so all of that is like oh that's that's not appealing yeah you know yeah, yeah, yeah. but what would be nice is like you know, you're a modest individual and you're, you're helping people behind closed doors. And that's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. And you've actively got the power, like the capital and the power, you know, the, the money talk sort of thing mm. to do mm. stuff for people. Like, yeah, yeah. When I think of, alhamdulillah, I think I'm quite good with saving because 
I I guess I never got into any of this uh, consumerism thing ever. Mm. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like I didn't even make money till later on in life. And then when I did, by then <laughs> me and, and anyone I was surrounded with were just fully not into consumerism at all. Like mm. in my circle, if you got if you had like more than one or two pairs of shoes, now you, now that's embarrassing. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what the hell, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that's kind of how I was, and and I guess I'm still like that. And so it's easy for me to save in that sense. Um, like, like I don't, I just, I just don't buy anything, bro. I just buy, uh, you know, stuff to to live, and then the rest I'm just trying to save it. Now and then I'll be like, like, like now I was telling you I, I'm looking uh, to buy a webcam, you know, to upgrade. Yeah. yeah. But that's after doing 80 episodes of a podcast. Yeah. Now yeah, I'm getting course. a webcam. But it's also part of your Ihsan element in terms of a project that you're working on. Like, I, I fully believe in that. Um, I think what's interesting is like, the, it's all about social currency again. It's like uh, these few years, for example, social media was something that I was very active on. You know, mm -hmm. everybody, everybody knew my face on social it's media. It's in your everybody name. knew who I was. It's in my name still. Um, <laughs> But what was like, for example, Instagram? Okay, what was Instagram primarily about? It was about putting yourself out there. You know, it's about showing people what your life was like. So, psycho, and that's not just for me. I'm talking about in general. We live in, especially now, bro, when you've got kids that are growing up purely on social media. And I was having this discussion at work because I'm suddenly getting exposed to kids that are like they're they're from birth. They've had social media, like that's their life. Um, and it's like, it's a currency for them. You know, I'm still, you know, me and you, for example, and more so yourself probably, we're still thinking very separate things about this is social media, this is the real world. Yeah. But like for for kids, like- I mean, It's blurred. Man. It's, it's blurred, bro, the whole thing. Like the whole thing, bro. Likes, like before we used to get, you get bullied at school, you get annoyed at school, and then you go home and you're fine because you're not, you don't take that stuff back home with you. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like at home, you're blessed. Yeah, but then, it's an in-person thing. Yeah, but now it's like you can't get away from the yeah, culture. Bad, it's it follows you everywhere. Yeah. So, like in that sense, people feel pressured into always having this rotating wardrobe. People feel pressured into always doing something new and showing that they're doing something new, um, and that fuels it. That fuels the the materialism more. And why do you think like Instagram mm. and Facebook and whatever capitalize on that by running ads all the time and showing you what's hot in the market? I mean, even I've seen videos of like. Uh, like even the fashion bro, even like the fashion industry is like oh this is what's in now and look at all these girls that are wearing it and then the moment you see somebody wearing it everybody else is wearing it like i remember this this woman i don't know she might be a teenager she she was wearing like a denim jacket and then she was like recording in this gathering of how many other women were wearing the same sort of denim jacket and black trousers mm. or something like that and it was insane bro like everybody's a copy following man but at the same time, we promote individualism where everybody has to be individual, but we all purchase the same. Yeah, yeah. We all want to be the same people. And Definitely. And, and what you said at the beginning is, is uh, very important, man. Like after so many years, like working and getting paid every month and this and that, what do we have that, you know, actually ha has value? Hmm. Um, that's a big question. And that's what I've been thinking, you know, like speaking to Sharif and thinking of those kind of things is like, it, it's still a very big deal to have 51 acres like him, to have land. That yeah, land, man. he can do so many things with that land, right? Firstly, obviously, it's got its value. It's probably only going to increase in value because, you know, land gets more yeah. and more scarce, etc. But also, if he wants to, like, let's say he can't afford it, but somebody wants to build an orphanage on his land, he could say, yeah, use some of my sure. land right yeah, yeah, of that's, course. that's like an extreme version of, of doing good or whatever if he wants to uh, actually my friend was telling me about um uh something that people do is they have a uh, farm schools kind of thing uh, and so it's a kind of a christian thing in america where uh kids i think when they're like 16 they go to farm yeah they'll do their normal school education there they'll do their religious christian education and then they'll work on the farm and they'll learn the a to z of farming so yeah. by the time they're like uh 20 or 21 or something like that they will be good in all three of these so they can go to uni or they can be yeah. a fa farmer they know the, the ins and outs of it or they can become like a priest or whatever right uh, so imagine like 
doing doing that for Muslims, you know. Um, uh, it's just it's just so many opportunities are open and and it, it, like what like when I when I buy uh, what is it, bro? What's something that people know? Like Nando's, right? Yeah. And I have that uh, half chicken. It's like ten pounds or however much it is. When I have that, bro. I actually paid that ten pounds probably for the first four bites of it. Yeah. After that, even though I'm still eating it, the kind of the the enjoyment, if you like, of it is actually gone. Like most of the enjoyment, the, there's actually research on this. The enjoyment of eating comes from the anticipation of eating it, not hey. from actually eating it. So Definitely. the first bite actually tastes like fifty percent better than the second bite, and then it goes yeah. downhill from there. Yeah. So we're spending money on these things and yes, we have to eat, but we don't necessarily have to eat, you know, these fancy things all the time. And you know, I, I eat out and so it's fine, but it's just like, what percentage of your income are you putting towards something that will last, you know, mm. something that's mm. worth something, even if it's putting into charity makes it last, right? Yeah. Putting it yeah. into uh, land makes it last, into property into, I don't know, like if I uh, buy a camera and this and that to make something educational, for example, which will again be there available to be able to benefit and uh, again that lasts so what are we building that lasts i think oh, that's the thing like question. i need to like i need to see tangible sort of i need to see the equation when i spend bro like the only the only thing and the major thing that i spend most of my money on is my family bro and that's and when, when it comes to my family it's like anything goes because at the end of the day i see it as kind of um i see it as feasibility you know best challenge you know if my wife wants to go out and do something she wants to go somewhere or, oh my internet connection is un unstable oh okay um mm, i thought it was mine let go sorry i was gonna say like um i i also think that we've entrapped ourselves in a way the, the culture that we live in, the societies that we live in that work nine to five, they a lot of them, the majority of them are saving to basically put house, put money on a mortgage, right? Mm, yeah. But we work just like them, but we haven't got that plan. So it's like we're, do you understand what I mean? Like yeah. they can maybe get away with it because at least they've got something that they're working towards. Like their normative thinking is like, okay, put money down on a mortgage and then one day retire and then pay off the mortgage and then that's it we've got a house and then the next generation can do whatever. Um, you know, for them, it's the easiest way of having some sort of longevity with their money or some sort of long-term investment. Mm. Uh, but for us, or for a lot of us, that, especially that the ones that don't think the mortgage is permissible, uh, then it's like, oh, we work just like those guys, but we don't do anything alternative in terms of longevity. So mm. actually, we just work, pay rent and die with nothing left. <laughs> You know, nothing left, not necessarily nothing left like we love the dunya, but nothing left for those that, let, you know, we leave behind. Mm, yeah. And I think those guys that are getting mortgages, they're not even thinking of their kids, I don't think. They're thinking of retirement. How am I yeah. going to retire and not have to pay rent, basically? Mm. Because mm. that'll be a struggle. So, and also, it's just because they're following because it's the normal thing to do. Um, it's a bit of a status symbol as well. So that's yeah. why they're doing that. Uh, but, but ultimately, yeah, for us, we could be thinking about definitely the kids and the next generation. Ultimately, the biggest thing I'm trying to purchase isn't, um, or we're trying to attain, isn't money or wealth. It's time. It's the fact that with wealth, you, you gain time. Like, that's the biggest thing, I think. Mm. Like, the moment you can, like, if I could attain some sort of, uh, you know, not business, but like something for my kids that meant that they wouldn't have to work the hours that we have or wouldn't have to, then that gives them time to do other things, to do more meaningful things, to, to work on themselves and to work on others. Like the reason why we can't progress is because we haven't got the time to do things. We haven't got the time to enrich our communities. Mm. Like once you've spent, you know, most of your day at work and then you spent the rest, the, you know, the remainder either asleep or with your family and what time have you got left for the community probably not much and what time have you got left for the rest of the umma probably not much either yeah you know i think it was uh mufti menk he, when he was on uh, the Ayera podcast with musa he was talking about how his family setup is that like half the brothers have businesses and that funds the the other half who are like doing dawah and stuff 
and he's like, you know, there's no shame in the fact that like I'm doing this side, they're doing that side. It's not like, oh, I'm the charity case. It's like, no, like we've set up a structure so that our family can produce to art and we can fund DAWA, you know, Definitely, that's pretty, that's pretty cool, man. And, and also yeah. even from a charity point of view, I saw, you know, a couple of uh, work projects launched this Ramadan. And that's really good to see, man, because I think they were saying that a billion pounds is given each year in the UK just from Muslims. Now, imagine just for one year, all that money went into Waqf investments, right? Let's say, you know, 10% annual return. That's a hundred million pounds every year generated for charity projects, right? After a one year uh, investing in it, right? Um, hundred million pounds every year. And that hundred million pounds is not coming from the Muslims' pockets, right? The next year, Muslims could still give another billion, but that hundred million is always there, right? And yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that is like mind boggling when you think of it in terms of, it, it, when you think of the efficiency of the giving that we're doing and the long-termness of it, if that's a word. So yeah, man, what, what did you, what were your, what was your feeling after, by the way, everyone listening to this, must listen to the last episode if they haven't like it was mm. really really good like i'm not just saying it because i enjoyed the topic but the comments and everything like uh, reflect that as well so uh yeah bro what were you feeling after after recording that episode i think uh you know living that life is very appealing mm. living the life of like off the grid is very appealing but it's more about what it represents to me as opposed to, you know, actually literally go, doing the same thing he did. But the represents, what it represented to me was like, the first thing is like, you don't need, you don't need the system that is marketed to you as necessary. You know, like the, the, the way we live is like, oh, that's necessary. Like this part of like, you know, you, you do in your tick box before you get married, hypothetically, and like, oh, I need to have this, need to have this, need to pay this, need to go find that. Like, no, no, that's not really necessary. Like, the brother went and lived, lived in a tent, bro. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, but like, why is that, why is that unfeasible? You know, it's difficult. You know, men will think, oh, well, what, what, what wife is going to want to live in a tent? Well, actually, if you think about it in terms of time, that's what it is about, isn't it? It's about the time that you gain for not having to chase paying, you know, rent and not having to chase paying this. And like made, he made investment. He, he worked, 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 got enough money to buy land and bought the land. Right. Okay. Now I don't need to think about where to live. Got the tent in some sort of setup to live there, bro. Like I saw the other day, someone lived in a, someone converted a bus, like a school bus into a house. Mm. And it was just, and I saw it and I was like, that is absolutely incredible. Like, mm especially somewhere in America where, you know, the, 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 the area you can travel to is vast. Mm -hmm. So you could combine that with what we have today. Like, okay, let's say the online business, right? You pay for like some sort of SIM card or some sort of 5G or 4G internet connection on your phone. Boom, you've got a hotspot, right? Get a laptop, start some sort of online business, start some sort of like teaching online, whatever it is online, some sort of skills you've attained. Okay, boom, you've got employment, you've got income coming in, right? Then you drive that, like every month you're driving that, bus to a different city to a different area park it up do you understand what i mean like boom that's it you're living rent free all you're paying for is gas and maintenance on that vehicle save up in case anything ever happens to that vehicle and you're good to go do you understand like i remember at one point my parents lived in a caravan bro mm. when they were working in the uk um i don't know the ins and outs of it all i know is that's what they did and yeah why did my dad do that? Because he was busy building and like trying to save and invest over in Tunisia. Sweet. Mm. Now he's got that. Do we pay rent in Tunisia? No. Do you know what I mean? Are there other things to pay for? Of course. You know, is healthcare free? Of course not. But that's one thing eliminated. That means the next generation don't have to think about that. As long as it, but the most important thing is that your next generation, and that's the one thing that I admire Sharif for, is that at the moment, and we're, inshallah, Allah continues it that way, this next generation have got their head screwed on, bro. Like they're getting involved in that kind of lifestyle. They've been yeah. brought up on that kind of lifestyle. It's not like you, you, you've done all of this stuff and you've, you've spent all your time thinking about money and wealth and future that actually you haven't focused on the nurturing of your kids. Mm. And then when you hand it over to your kids, they're just like, oh, I'm going to sell all of this and I'm going to go and live in the city and live nine to five yeah. like the rest yeah. of the people do. That's the biggest fear, but no. Mm. So ultimately, uh, taking back 
ownership. Actually, like we are Muslims, bro. We are people that right now we don't have our, um, you know, our, I mean, I'm not even getting, getting into this deeply, but we know we don't have our like Khalifa and we don't have our Sharia. We don't have like the, those sort of things in place. But, and then we're like, we're like this, bro, to the people that are above us in the sense that, that provide for us, like whether that's benefits, whether that's the food chain, whether that's the system, whether that's like mass production, you know, um, we are just enslaved to that kind of system, bro. And what Sharif was sh showing us was incredible, bro. Like, bro, he's got, I mean, he's, I know he's not trying to do a hundred percent, but he's, he's got his food, bro. He's got his, uh, you know, he's got his meat, he's got his, his crops, he's got, he get, if it's something he needs that his neighbours have, then he would rather trade it with them than he would trade it with some sort of mass-produced nonsense, bro. Um, it's about breaking up that system that has basically got a monopoly over everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then putting that power back into the hands of the community that you cherish and the community that you, um, that you, you want to share those values with. Um, like it makes you brothers, wonder, sisters. like, you know, like some of the big masajid in the UK, mm. millions of pounds have been put into that, right? Creating that. Right. And yeah, it's true. Uh, those masajid tend to serve like tens of thousands of Muslims, right? But it does make you wonder, like, if that, like five million pounds, let's say, if that was put into buying, you know, huge amounts of land, like in an area like his, and you know people can come over maybe they buy it at subsidized cost and then building a masjid there building houses there building it like you can i think i mean maybe it would benefit less number of people but the amount that it would benefit those people that do live like that would be huge basically you would be establishing a fully islamic village because with that amount of money from based on what he's talking about the prices and all of that we're talking about hundreds or thousands of muslims who could come over own land uh, have their houses they could easily within that money they could build a school build a masjid and now you're growing up you're living very islamically bro even in america even in new mexico yeah bro he um, mentioned it briefly i mean look at the yeah. amish community bro like they just they hold on to that culture yeah bro. So and somewhere part of the reason i think is because you're in the middle of nowhere and, and you don't bother people and they don't bother you and exactly. you're living freely bro he was saying yeah. everyone was like all distancing and masks and stuff he's like we were eating iftar together we were praying tarawih together because yeah, yeah, ultimately yeah. no one was no one cares about what what we do and even he was saying, like, I don't immunize my kids anymore, vac vaccinate them. Uh, we didn't get into the, the reason, but I was thinking, like, if you live in the middle of nowhere, who are you going to catch these diseases off? I mean, yeah, assuming yeah, yeah. they're diseases that come from people and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely, bro. And I think, uh, ultimately, I think we'd be ignorant to not, to not consider the power that money gives an individual. And I'm not talking about power, like power of arrogance and power of, you know, loving oneself. I'm talking about like the power to protect people, the power to protect communities. Like, okay, if you're, you're a Muslim that is, you know, you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are pro practicing Islam properly. Like I would rather that you've got the wealth as opposed to, I don't know, some next non-Muslim person. Yeah. Do you get me? So like the moment like that family, that community is in danger from like, whether it's the government, or whether it's the, you know some sort of outside sort of pressures or whatever. Well, actually, I can afford the best lawyers, and I can support this family that's in trouble, and I oh, can God. build business. Do you know what I mean? Like money is money is pu pushing power. Mm. It's, it's talking power, mm. bro. It's it's mm. power to make moves and changes. I feel like why do you think why do you think corporations are able to just like pressure politicians into set, well because they've got that money power, bro. And mm. I think with prime, bro. I think we're prime for like bidnilah, <sighs> bidnilah. We're primed for like real practicing brothers and sisters. And I'm talking about like real practice. Like that's the forefront of their mission. You know, we're not talking about, oh, the forefront of my mission is to get money and actually I'm Muslim on the side or I'm Muslim by name or I'll speak about Islam to the Muslims, but I won't speak about it to the wider world. Mm. No, we're, we're, we're approaching the, like those Muslims that, are, you know, are, their prime reason for being on this dunya is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they've got that wealth, they've attained that wealth, and they're talking, bro. They've got that pushing power to talk, yeah. bro. 
and they're to already, make changes. And, and the, there is a generation that already exists um, in, in doing those kind of things. Like, like who, who do you think is funding Zakir Naik's work, like Peace TV? Yeah, of course. Who's, of course. Who's funding Aira? Or, or I know a lot of donations go to Aira now, but who, who funded Aira in the first few years? Who, um, uh, what was I thinking of? Uh, uh, Abdurrahman al sumait you know, the Kuwaiti yeah. who, doctor who would like dedicate his life to like Dawa and then uh, helping people in Africa. But, and this is it, like, um, actually, like, so, yeah. those, are, those, are, those are, from what I, I mean, Allah knows best, I mean, Allah reward them, but a lot of them are like so, silent protagonists in the way that like, yeah, yeah. The money that's going, we don't know who they are. Yeah, yeah. But like, if you think of the time of the, the Prophet oh, the, the first people to, you know, to become Muslim, the Sahaba, essentially, they were from different sort of, diff, they had different sort of uh, ability and different sort of influence in, on how Islam spread. And it, when, you know, when this, the, the Sahaba that were like wealthy basically got into, became Muslim, yeah, yeah. The, the, the power, the pushing power became like, oh, yeah, like the, yeah, yeah. The, the people of Quraysh started noticing that because now yeah. they've got they've got defense now they've got like yeah. power to be mm. reckoned with because mm. the re the main reason um you know that the, the, the Quraysh were, felt threatened was oh look this is going to take money away from 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 uh, you know our idol worship that we have people coming from all over the world coming here to to worship their idols etc um but now you've got people with money that are actually converting. Well, this is this is pushing power. Now this is talking power, and this is the same thing. I think. Like, imagine like you had someone on the scale of like, I don't know. I mean, it's a bit out there, but you know, people like Steve Jobs or or flipping Jeff Bezos or flipping Elon Musk or whoever it is. But actually, their prime mission isn't to land rockets on the moon or to or to. Do you understand what I mean? Like, their their main mission is to. I don't know, end world hunger actively because they're Muslim and that's what they're about. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. to actually make these big changes to eradicate poverty, to eradicate that. This is what I'm talking about, bro. Like mm. this should be Not what we're about. We should be, spectrum. yeah, we should be at the forefront of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And this is why, like, I mean, listen, I've been listening um, recently to like, people like Omar Suleiman, for example, um, who a lot of people criticize because he's too, what's the word? I don't know, out there in like the political sphere or, or um, mm. what's the word, activism and stuff like that. Yeah. And I'm like, nah, man, like everyone, every Muslim should have their expertise in a certain field, you know? And if, he, he, if he's got an ability to make a difference and make changes, positive changes in the community that he's from and the country that he's from and actively be like, yeah, I'm Muslim. Like, that's who I am. Like, I'm Imam Omar Suleiman. Like, yeah, go for it. Because we need voices, bro. Like, you can't sit here and suffer in silence and suffer the oppression that we have and suffer at the hands of others who aren't, and nobody's doing talking for us. Do you understand? Like, yeah, people get lost in like the source of who, what everybody's about or what, mm. you know, they have to be completely aligned to what my belief system is, or what my understanding of the Dean is or whatever. Like, come on, man. Mm. And, and the reason why I think I've been more exposed to that is because of the history of our religion, the history of our Ummah. Like, you know, the same people we celebrate are the same people we would not agree with right now. Yeah, yeah, true. You know, like, so, like okay, yesterday was the 4th of July. Uh, Salah, Salah ad uh retaking of um, Jerusalem, I believe, was the anniversary of it was yesterday. People like parade around Salah ad like, yeah, sweet, incredible leader. But actually, if you looked at his some of his beliefs you today in today's context there's a lot of muslims would be like oh i don't think i would fully align with him do you know what i mean um but without without his efforts maybe you know you wouldn't have uh the the muslims that we have in Palestine and the muslims that we have yeah, like, would we even have that we, did, we, we wouldn't you know and people you're never gonna find people not never but the the people that you fully 100 percent agree with you will never find other than like uh, you know, a small percentage, you know. Yeah. So I think, you know, we have to become comfortable if we're not already. We have to be com become comfortable with, for example, I was saying this a while ago, like, Sheikh so-and-so, um, I don't agree with him. You know, I really don't agree with him. But yeah. that doesn't take away from the fact he's a Sheikh. But I, oh, what yeah. I find a lot of people saying is that when they don't agree with someone, they find ways to say, no, he's not actually a sheikh. Why can't you say, 
no, yeah, he is a sheikh, but I just really not really agree. I don't really yeah. agree with that. You know, or like when you don't re agree with someone strongly, you're like, okay, how can we find a way to say he's not from Ahlul Sunnah or he did this bid out? It's like, just say it, just like, just, it's, uh, I feel like it's just out, you're not living in reality Bro. if you think that way. Like, yeah, and it's, uh, it's, you will it's, never align 100% except with certain, probably the people who are closest in your circle or Achy, who you study the, from. The, po the people Other that are close, that. There's yeah. people that are super close in my circle, like mm. that I consider like some of my best friends and Muslims, mm. you know, amazing brothers. And like some of their understandings and not their understandings, but like some of their, I'd, I'd say maybe more methodologies of how like the deen should be, and, like the deen should be spread and stuff. Like I'm absolutely like, not on, like mm. I'm not on that flex whatsoever. Mm. But you know what? Um, without that sort of mutual, like, okay, you think that and I think this, Aqidah, like, alhamdulillah, like we understand what, who Allah is and where Allah is in that sense. But even so, even so, Akhi, woo, even so, we can't all sit here bickering with each other on issues that aren't, I'm not saying that these things aren't important. I'm saying that we should keep seeking knowledge. We should keep, like, if I believe something and you believe something and actually there's a difference there and we can talk about that, you know, mutually. And let's yeah, say you want to hold on to your position, I'll hold on to mine. That's what, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, but then the moment someone else walks into the room, we're not distracted by this. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, you know, and the, at the end of the day, like, the rest of the world are walking all over us and we're, we're going like this. But actually, yeah. no, we can have that discussion in private. Like me and you can have that discussion. Yeah. But then when, when we've got another contender entering the room, we need to be aware of what's going on over there. We need to yeah. be aware of, you mm. know, our, our, our Ummah getting, yeah. you know, absolutely pillaged behind us while we're going like this all the time. And I know you're and saying you see, that now because you've been looking at history and stuff. And that's you, no, a big eye-opener. That is a big eye-opener. And I, I actually, you know, I think... I just, I fell into a trap of just assuming that it was all, you know, rosy, you know, like that our history was all great. You know, we had our ups and downs, but our ups and downs were only because of outside forces. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, yeah. oh yes, the Mongols wiped us out. Well, actually, yeah, everybody thinks that Islamic history was absolutely stupendous until the Mongols wiped us out. Well, no, that was like hundreds of years. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like there was ups and downs and there was infighting and there was yeah. God knows what else before that. Yes, yeah. we had our ups and downs, but a lot of that was because of our own sort of disunity and our own mm. sort of backstabbing yeah. mm. and our focus on the issues mm. we had with each mm. other, which mm. led us to be mm. like, oh, there's these Mongols coming? Nah, don't worry, we're fine. We're, we're like, we'll deal with that. Yeah. And then they go on our doorstep and we got wiped out, bro. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a good summary of like uh, how, yeah, I mean, at least my, my opinion so far of Islamic unity is kind of what you described, where it's like, I'm going to be very clear with you about what I disagree with you on, but that's not going to stop me uniting with you for certain greater goods and, and things like that. Yeah, it's, I think that's it's a like, good summary. Like, it's like... Like, it's, you're not going to hide the difference. You're going to be open no. about the differences, um, and you're still going to debate those in the correct context, but then yeah. you're also aware of the bigger picture. And the, in the yeah. end, it's like, if something is good... And especially if that person is a Muslim, work together for that good that you both agree exactly, is good. Exactly. Um, while not brushing those important differences uh, under the you know carpet. Yeah, and I think we just uh, we have taken it to extremes. I think I know I have. I know I I was affected by sort of the extremity as of like mm. I would only listen to. It got to a point where I didn't even know who to listen to anymore because there was issues with everybody. And that's what I think, that's what just pulled the rug out from under my feet. I was like, bro, I can't, you can't live like this. You can't live with like mm. anyone who has a mistake or anyone who's made a mistake is suddenly you can't listen to them. Because at yeah. the end of the day, there was no one left, Akhi. Mm. Because even the most, the ones that were screamed from the rooftops the loudest about being, you know, upon the, the truth and, you know, blessed is that. There was still criticism of them being too extreme. So like no one's free from criticism. Do you understand? No one's free from that kind of thing. So actually you have to really have a balanced understanding of what is not acceptable, but what you can live with, what you can debate freely with, what you can actually discuss. And then like, what is actually a danger to your community? You know, what is degeneracy and what is going to really harm the people that you care about? That's, a, that's another story. Yeah. But like, meanwhile, like we're doing that and we're doing this and actually there's, you know, I, I sound really shallow with it all, but these are these are true arguments. These are real real arguments. Like how how long has Syria been at war for? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like how long have we? 
actually like we years are going by like it's been like over a decade now like it felt like it started yesterday bro. Mm. This, this you know it's been like eight years uh, it feels, nine years yeah. but it's, it just feels like forever it feels yeah. like forever. actually the other day i was at work and so we picked up a, a a refugee from iraq like 16 17 year old kid came here on a truck uh hasn't seen light for a month because he's been in the back of a truck since Turkey. Like, doesn't even know how he got here. Like, he knows he got to England, but he doesn't even know the route. Do you know what I mean? Like, the truck driver opened the back of the truck and he just ran, didn't even know where he was. Walking for two hours, ended up down here, picked him up, spoke to Like, I was the only person to speak Arabic in the whole, you know, station. So I spoke to him, like, got his story. I was like, bro, like, you know, not Allah knows best what those stories are, but the fact is, these are people's lives. He's a part of our ummah, love. Yeah. That running away from things, bro. It's, yeah. It's nuts. And then you've got like, you've got like, okay, I have to talk about this. I know we've been going on for ages, but I, like it's mandatory. And I'm sure you've seen it already. Um, the, uh, the, the flipping, uh, the French political move that happened uh, yesterday or a few days ago. Okay. Where Fra- news to me. Okay. So France returned the skulls of 24 Algerian decapitated while fight while fighting French colonists over 170 years ago, after they were decapitated, their skulls were taken to France as trophies and displayed in museums of man, in the Museum of Man in Paris. So I don't know if anyone can see my phone, but like, yeah, that's like all the skulls that were set up in the museum. These are yeah. skulls of like our, our brothers and sisters that were in museums that were decapitated. This is them back in Algeria, and they've obviously draped the Algerian flags over them and given them proper like, you know, funerals and stuff. This is the skull of. Uh, Sheikh Musa al Darkawi. That's a picture of him, and that's actually his skull that they had on display because they yeah. took over. Uh, mm. You know, France returned the skulls. Twenty-four Algerians decapitated while fighting French colonists. One of the skulls returned was Sheikh Musa al Darkawi. Uh, Sheikh Musa was an Egyptian, a student of Sheikh Mohammed bin Hamza Bafir al Madani. Sheikh Musa settled in central Algeria in 1829 and joined the colonial resistance. He fought alongside Sheikh. Bu- Bouzi, Bu, no, Bouzian, sorry, who led the colonial resistance during the 1849 Battle of Z- uh, Zacha, a village in northern Algeria. Uh, anyway, what I'm saying is like, bro, like, look at this man. <laughs> Actually, like, those are the mm. actual skulls of our ummah on display in a museum in France. And only, to, only this week have the, have the French decided, oh, do you know what? We should give this back to 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 the algerians like this is real bro like the the real sort of oppression of our people and we are busy with each other like we are busy with each other like that hurt me man to think like you know uh, you know like uh, actually you're algerian bro like any one of those skulls could be one of your ancestors same with i mean we're all north african at the end of the day like yeah, my, yeah. my wife the same thing like any one of our ancestors I've been through stuff like that. Actually, like mm. I look deeper into that, like that sort of um, element of them decapitating people. Um, bro, they were they were parading around like the skulls of our people, like on on the top tips of their rifles, bro. It's insane. Mm. It's insane. And, I mean, this for me, the biggest thing is with this is is whenever. Um, I mean, really, we can generalize most of these uh, European countries whenever they talk about civilization and enlightenment just don't even listen man. they have no, no they have no place to speak from yeah. no place it's it like it's like what i said yesterday after i shared those two articles i said like mm. they sit on their high horse of morality and and like flipping um you know um the the the, the democratic system and how like oh we're we are leaders of the flipping free mm. world Mm. Based on the blood that they've, you know, they're sailing yeah. their boat on the on the blood of of mm. others. Yeah. Like their ocean is literally red with blood. Yeah, um, yeah they've got and, no, but, no uh, but, authority. They're not coming from. But, any but we can't sit. We can't sit and say that. Like we can't read the history and say, "Oh, look, point the finger at them." Yeah. We also have to. We also have to see what led us to be in such a weak position, which yeah, is I mean, that element of disunity. Which is that element of like, the, bro, like the fact that, you know. The whole of North Africa, bro, split itself up initially because of the infighting of the Muslims to then have a colonialist come over and be like, okay, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine. You know? Mm. It's nuts, man. 
It's absolutely mm. nuts. And on top of all of that is the knowledge, the lack of knowledge, the lack of knowledge that actually kept us united in the first place. The yeah. one thing that unifies all of us is our worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is yeah. our tawheed, you know, in Allah and our belief yeah. system in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with, ta with correct knowledge comes correct unity as well <laughs> and, and balanced unity, right? Yeah. Uh, not the type of unity where, you know, you just, anyone who claims to be with you, you're like, yeah, yeah, calm. And not the other way, where it's like, no, you have to be amongst the one percent of people who are exactly like me. So yeah. uh, again, that comes with proper knowledge and being uh, not just uh, the actual knowledge of the law, but I feel like a wider knowledge of like society, history, things like that. Man. Definitely. Man. Yeah, I'm. I'm a bit. I feel sometimes I'm a bit too much into the money thing because I know we're talking about money and using money for for good influence. Sometimes I feel like a lot of the work I'm doing in my business and, you know, my business, like I guess I could be taking more out of it for my gain, but I put it back in because I'm like, no, I can't be, you know, milking this cow until the cow is a certain size. Like it's got to yeah, get yeah, yeah. a certain size. So, um, so I think of that. And then when I think of, for example, Sarah Masters or the, the book, I'm, con I'm thinking, how can I make this book? Uh, profitable when I advertise it so that then I can advertise it more and I can make more profit and none of that is for me I'm just thinking how can I reach 50,000 Muslims a month using ads yeah, yeah that's how I'm thinking because yeah, yeah. I understand that you know I put money in to the ads then hopefully you know brothers and sisters will support it and buy and then the money again will go in to get to reach more people and as long as it's like break even it's positive because the positive is that I've reached those tens of thousands of people. Yeah, of course. But at the same time, like you're not every Muslim's goal or not every Muslim is destined to be the one who has the skill set to, to do certain like things or to lead in certain areas. Like, actually, yeah. like if your book is focused on what it's focused on, then that could actually spark the person to do, to make the change, to do something yeah, about message, that. you know, and that's your, that's your lane, you know, yeah. that's your, just yeah. like now, I feel like, I know, it's, I know it's really, like I, you know, it's really low level. It's really minuscule, but like the graphic design stuff I do, like, you know, I'm, I'm very particular about who I work with and who I support and whatever. However, like, bro, if I'm going to make something for somebody, I'm going to make sure that that's like the cutting edge of art because the, the stuff I try to do and I've always tried to do, has been like, Hey, we're not doing, we're not sticking to this bubble that we've created for ourselves where it's just like, let's do a bit of an Islamic calligraphy and let's no, like I want my stuff to compete with those top people that are out there. Mm. like do you know what i mean like i'm not gonna settle for you know here's a cheap little thing or mm. slap it on your project or slap it on your t-shirt mm. or slap it on whatever you're doing no like bro like a lot of the people that that engage with my overtly religious art mm. are non-muslims mm. do you know what i mean like the message that i try to yeah but that <laughs> not made it but like I want to compete on that level. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm not competing with like my peers. I'm competing yeah. with a completely different audience. Yeah. But I'm bring, yeah. but I'm sending the message to them mm. directly mm. through my work. Mm. Yeah. And that's what it's about. Mm. That's the same thing. Like actually, like this risk thing, like this risk banking thing. Like yes, you've you your main immediate audience is the Muslims, but no, you should be competing with Monzo, like yeah. mentally. Do you know yeah. what I mean? You yeah. should be thinking, like, what can, what are they doing that I can trump? And then through that, you send in the message of what Islam is. What was Islam? How did Islam spread in like, uh, um, mm. you know, like Malaysia, Indonesia, that kind of neck of the woods? It's through trade. It's through coming down there, being better than the locals in regards to trade, mm. in regards to the product, the quality, the mm. business, you know, the character. business, yeah. the character, the business, businessmanship of it all. Mm. I mean, like, yo, these Muslims know what they're doing. Like, what is this religion? Yeah. You know? Like, like so even is, little things. It is as simple as that sometimes. Right? Yeah, little things, Aki. Like anyway, I'm not going to talk about my deeds. I don't want to do that. But like little things, bro. You do little things. You do. Yeah. And as long as you're direct about it, like, oh, this isn't me. This is Islam. You know. Mm. Someone asks you, why did you just do that? No, that's not me. Like that's not because I'm. This is what my religion teaches me to do. You know, simple, simple, yeah. simple. That one, bro. That one with power. It's not just talking to someone. It's showing someone. It's showing someone. Look at what my religion has made me do. Like, look how my religion has boosted me to be better than what your project is about. Because your project is thinking just about that. I'm thinking about this. Like, I'm thinking about the whole world. 
<laughs> yes, 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 yes. Okay, bro, let's wrap it up, inshallah. Um, everyone listening, remember we're on like uh, YouTube as well, so there's a video version. Um, that's uh, that link for that, actually, I'll just put it in the description of the podcast and stuff. And then obviously, if you're watching the video, then of course, there is the, the audio only version, which is in the description again. And if you have any questions, comments, feedback, uh, anonymous or otherwise, go to Mus- uh, go to mine. <laughs> well, I get mixed up with all the different projects. Sometimes I'm like, it's a mean from Sarah Masters. It's a mean with, Mus- with, with Muslim CEO. It's a mean from Mind High. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, bro um yeah go to mindhousepodcast.com any questions comments feedback and uh yeah inshallah we'll keep these episodes coming inshallah we'll be uh we'll be upgrading the camera and stuff like that inshallah so, yeah soon. inshallah we're going to try and sort of we're going to try we're trying i mean we haven't we were going to speak about this before but we're trying to sort of elevate mind heist now to like we've been doing this for you know we're coming up to 100 episodes soon and sure. you know we've we've got some really valuable listeners that are always engaging into every episode and we're getting you know a, a nice following of people that consistent audience because people dip in and out and stuff but we've got people that listen to every single episode bro and they're always engaging and stuff mm-hmm. and we you know we owe it to them we owe it to the what we built so far to try and elevate what we do and um you know, I know a lot of people wanted videos and this is our first sort of, sort of what, 10, 20 episodes of doing videos. I don't know how long we've been doing it for, but because the technology has allowed us to. Um, and if there's, you know, we're open to suggestions. We're open to other involvement. If anybody thinks, hey, mm. it'd be really great if you guys could try and do this. Like we're getting, we're trying to find not just guests that everybody knows. Like we're trying to find people that have incredible story. Like Sharif's story was amazing. Like, and I'd, have to, I'd love to have more people that I don't know anything about mm. to just, come with something like that actually because that's it that meant more to me bro <laughs> you know what i mean i'm not saying I, I have nothing i've got nothing wrong with like these shiuch that we know of and these leaders of, that we know of but we know their story bro there's so many stories out there that we don't know um so yeah if you have any sort of suggestions if you have if you want to be part of like the mind high sort of thing like whatever this thing is you know, if you want to try, if you think you've got something you could offer or try and work with us on something, mm. hit us up, man. Our emails yeah, yeah. are always open. Um, you know, we've got our social medias. We want to be able to do more stuff with that. If you've got ideas yeah. that we can do with our social medias mm. or you want to, if you feel like you're a content creator or, or you produce stuff and you want mm. to be part of like the Mind High sort of team or whatever, hit us up mm. and we can see what we can do. Yeah. I would love to do more with Mind High like social media pages. Um, but like we're, mm. we are, me and you are just busy, man. Yeah, We've got yeah. so much to do like that. I mentioned earlier, like that clip, for example, it was yeah. really beneficial. The engagement yeah. was amazing. Yeah. However, it just took me so long to do. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And likewise, like we talk about, we spoke a lot about businesses today and Muslim businesses. If you feel like you've got a business that you really want to get out there, um, in the same way that we promoted um, Amin's project, Amin's book, in the same way we promoted Pure XI in the past. Um, yeah, if you've got a business that we feel like, hey, your business is great, we'd love to you know, shout, shout it out and talk about it on the show. Just hit us up, honestly, because we're, mm-hmm. we're not saying that out of just like, oh, we want a marketing opportunity. We're sincerely saying that because we want to support other platforms, other businesses, other projects that are out there. And we also want to be able to talk about them and promote them and, and mm-hmm. share that with the rest of the Ummah. So, yeah, we might yeah. talk about this more next episode because mm-hmm. we'll be more planned. This is mm-hmm. a bit impromptu, but yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. it's probably I think- very late for you, bro. Yeah, well, you know, like me and you, we give this, you know, a couple hours a week. You know, I think that's what we were able to do to keep things consistent. And, you know, yeah. we, we pay the bills for, for whatever's needed for this and stuff. And then uh, if someone else could give an hour a week and then another person give an hour a week, then it can really uh, build. Because obviously there are some fundamentals that you need to, you need to do these minimum things to expect growth, right? Alhamdulillah, one of those things is like consistency and, and quality and stuff, which we've been doing. But then there are other things, obviously, that would take the growth to a next level. So that would be good. Uh, and yeah, so if you, if you want to get in touch about that, then again, just go to mindheistpodcast.com uh, and the email is there. Um, yeah, another good episode, Muhammad. Jazakallah khairan. And uh, see you next episode, inshallah, everyone. Yeah, Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa